Hey, everybody, it's Eric alongside Rod, and we are thrilled to welcome Jay Billis into with us today. Uh, Jay is an analyst, as you probably know, with ESPN. Uh, he was a four-year starter at Duke under Coach Krzyzewski, played in Final Four, national champion in 1986. Also an assistant coach at Duke, you know, while he was a little busy attending law school, he's now attorney in law in North Carolina while also uh, serving as an uh, ESPN in various capacities. Nominated for an Emmy for outstanding performance as a studio analyst, uh, both in 07 and 08. He's appeared in commercials all the time and it actually been in a future length film, which I've now forgotten the name of. <laughs> Jay, thanks so much for coming on the Final Fours on the schedule. We appreciate it. Well, Eric, thanks for having me. Great to be with you. Yeah, it's great. I'm going to actually hand it right over to Rod to, to lead us off here. You've had a, a very um, vocal take over the years on issues related to quality of the game. So things like the way rules are enforced, the way games are officiated, freedom of movement, those things. We have another question related to quality of the game that we wanted to kick this off with. And it's something that, that Eric and I have talked about on the podcast a fair amount this year. There are these two elements that everybody is talking about currently, one being NIL and the other being the transfer portal. And it seems to us in some ways from a quality perspective, not an ethical perspective, they may be operating at cross currents. Um, NIL obviously has served to keep some players in the college game longer than they might have otherwise. Uh, you know, Hunter Dickinson being a very recent Big Ten example, but there are scores of them. And that would seem to help from a quality perspective. But, you know, we, we wonder if one of the quality impacts of the portal has been a lack of continuity uh, with a lot, within a lot of programs and that that's led to maybe more inconsistency. Uh, in level of play than we would have seen otherwise. Uh, what's your what's your take on the state of the game from a quality perspective right now, and maybe specific to those two um, those two phenomena? That's an interesting question. I think the quality of the game, the college game, is is very good. It's very high. Uh, it's certainly changed from from decades ago, where players stuck around for longer, and you had teams that were older together. Uh, so you don't see that as much. So, so uh, the term you use continuity, I think is, is much different now, but these players are ultra talented. Uh, and, uh, and I think the game is, uh, it was at a really good place a few years ago when I think freedom of movement uh, had, uh, had taken hold and we were doing a good job. Uh, I think it's sort of moved backward a little bit. It doesn't mean the game's not uh, entertaining. It's not great but it was better before. And I think if we went, uh, you know, moved it forward and we were emphasizing the offensive component of the game more so than the defensive component, you know, I have a colleague, Reese Davis, who said that basketball is an offensive game with a defensive component. And, uh, and I think it's skewed to, to give the defense too many advantages, but, but reasonable minds can differ on that. Uh, the, the college space is in a little bit of an odd place right now. And one of the reasons is it's stuck in, in this uh, philosophical abyss that it can't seem to get out of. You know, it's trying to say that, that uh, athletes are, are students who just happen to be athletes and athletes are students to be treated like any other student. Mm -hmm. And yet they're restricted in what they can earn or accept. Uh, and at the same time, uh, up until recently, they were uh, athletes in five sports only were restricted in their ability to transfer and play right away and participate in what is, is said by the NCAA is simply to be an extracurricular activity. And so with the transfer portal, what we're seeing is a number of, of athletes that are transferring, uh, quote unquote, up. They go from a mid-major level to a high major level, but we're seeing an equal number of transfers that are leaving the high major level and going down to mid-major. And uh, so we can argue as to, to the effect of that. The, the one effect that's clear is it's been difficult for most coaches for, to feel comfortable that they have roster continuity from year to year. They're spending most of April and May re-recruiting the players that are on their roster and also trying to find new players that are in the transfer portal. I don't think the portal is particularly well executed. Um, it was done, in, in my view, not in an intelligent way or the most intelligent way. 
Uh, but I do feel that players that do transfer should be allowed to play right away. I don't see any reason that 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 amateur athletes and, and students to be treated like any other student should be required to give up a year of their lives because they want to change schools. I don't think that's a, a particularly uh, it, it's like a, a non-compete provision in an employment contract when the right. NCAA is falling all over themselves saying they're not employees. Uh, so okay. it, it's difficult. It's a difficult and I feel for the coaches. Um, because so many of them are older and they remember a time when it wasn't this way and they're harking back to it. Uh, but I do think some of them are missing the fact that there have been, there's been massive change in college sports over the years, mostly on the revenue side. And none of them complained when their salaries went way up. None of them complained when they started flying private. None of them complained about it. And, uh, and, and they, a few of them might have, but, but generally they didn't complain about it, but when athletes somehow have, have rights now, uh, now the, uh, uh, you know, now the world is coming to an end and doomsday is around the corner and I just don't see it that way. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think we would tend to agree with your, the general tenor of your position. You know, one of the things is, as Michigan state alums, Michigan state fans is, as you well know, Tom Zo has been and continues to be very vocal about what he sees as the downsides to the portal. And I, I find myself in a funny position because I think some of what he says, I, I happen to believe is true in terms of those downsides that it doesn't do anything to foster resiliency. Um, that might in some instances be a negative in terms of the development of a young person. But it just seems to me that those considerations are ultimately trumped by what you just articulated, the same kind of freedom that any other student would have to move on, it, it should be paramount, I think, above, above and beyond anything else. But it's an awkward position for Michigan State fans to be in, I think. Yeah, and Tom and I talk about this all the time. And one of the, uh, you know, one could, could posit that we argue about it a lot. Um, but I never, I never question Tom in, in being pure of heart in this. And he and I may differ on some policy issues, but it just doesn't change the fact that I love him. And honestly, I wish that I could have played for for two coaches, Coach K and him. I would have loved to have played for Tom Izzo. He would have hated coaching me, but I would have loved to play for him. <laughs> and, you know, but but there, there are fair points there, but not every player transfers because they don't want to go through adversity. Right. And they just turn tail right. at the first right. sign of difficulty. That That's not true. And, and it, it's true with some, but it's not true with the overwhelming majority. And one of the great things about the portal is there's, there are a number of players out there that are what I would call under-recruited out of high school. Maybe they didn't develop when, uh, when they were, they weren't fully developed when they recruited, they weren't viewed a certain way. And their best option was go to a mid-major program and they blow up there. And they proved, no, I was worthy of playing where I really wanted to play, but didn't have the opportunity. And now they have the opportunity to play on that bigger stage. And look, I'm not comparing players and coaches because I know Izzo hates when I do that. But, but as, a, as a comparison, when a coach at Cleveland State has a great year, then that coach can transfer up and take a job at Michigan State uh, if that job were open. Uh, and, and you saw the, the value of it when Bryn Forbes, uh, uh, who was not heavily recruited out of high school, did extraordinarily well at Cleveland State. He transferred up to Michigan State, and now he's in the NBA. And right. the, the problem is that, that the Cleveland States of the world believe that, wait a minute, Bryn Forbes was our asset. We developed that, and we, re we, we deserve a return on that investment. And I understand the feeling, but the NCAA says, no, you know, that the scholarship is the, is the reward. And, and if Bryn Forbes leaves, if they kick him off the team, if he decides to quit playing, that scholarship is still available for someone else. That's the asset. And look, I, I don't, I, I think the reality is the players are the asset. They're assets of the university <laughs> and the university wants to uh, return on those assets. And that's where the disconnect comes. This is pro sports that won't admit it's pro sports. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Soon, uh, like, look, pardon me. I, I think this is a certainty. 
that absent Congress stepping in and providing some sort of federal law that protects the NCAA's antiquated and, and I think unfair system of compensating athletes, we're going to see schools signing players to contracts. And in those contracts may and could be buyouts if a player decides to leave before the term of the contract is over. Uh, we're going to see contract provisions where if a player gets in trouble, gets arrested, uh, uh, commits some act that, that the school finds against a morality clause, that the contract can be terminated. And if an athlete falls behind in studies and becomes academically ineligible, the, the contract can be terminated. If they miss practice a certain number of times, the contract can be terminated. Things like that, which will give the school a greater degree of control and, uh, and it will also give them uh, a, a more recognizable market that they're competing in instead of against all these collectives where a lot of what they hear may be rumor, it may be overinflated. Uh, right. People aren't sure what the market is right now. At least they say they're not. Because I, I think, look, I think all these coaches know exactly whom to recruit and exactly whom to put in the game when they want to win. They know exactly what these players are worth to them. Just like they know they're not sitting up at night, university decision makers aren't sitting up at night going, what do we do here? It would be horribly unfair of us to pay the head of the, the hospital system uh, more than we pay the head of the landscape crew, because the landscape crew works just as hard as the hospital. So, like, that's stupid to say that. Not everybody makes the same in any endeavor, and not every athlete's going to make the same. And people understand meritocracy. We're not going to have fights in the locker room. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, you yeah. you actually uh, <laughs> already anticipated my next question, which was going to be, and I think you've made it pretty clear what your thoughts are, whether you think it's inevitable that we're heading toward an some type of employer-employee structure in college athletics. And it seems that that's your conclusion. It's, it's the same one I have. I'm also an attorney, and although I'm not a labor guy, um, I can read these cases, and even though cases like Alston and, um, and O'Bannon haven't directly spoken, I think you can see the way that this is heading. And so it, it seems that that's, that's what you're saying. Do you think, and, and again, I think I surmise this from your comments, that this is actually something that can be in the long run a positive, for ma certainly for major college athletics, and that it will provide a structure and maybe a limitation on what people are describing currently as sort of unlimited free agency. Yes, I, I, I do. And, and I hear what people are saying when they use the term free agency, but free agency comes after players have contracts and, right. and, you know, free agency is, is written into those contracts and it's written into the collective bargaining agreements. So as you mentioned on the labor law side, I, I often hear people who will will engage with me on these issues say, well, there needs to be a salary cap. I mean, you know, the NFL has a salary cap. The NBA has a salary cap. That's true. They do. But those leagues collectively bargain with the players and I, the players receive 50 percent of, of revenue in those endeavors. Right. And right now, college athletes are cheap and they're cheap relative to the amount of money that's generated and they're cheap relative to the value of their services. Uh, so no matter what, this is still new. So it seems odd that, wait a minute, this guy made this much money doing endorsements and from a collective, that's crazy. Well, it's not crazy. They're worth a lot more than they're making right now. And so are athletes in non-revenue sports. Uh, everything that the NCAA said that was going to, going to lead to doomsday with NIL has been a lie. They said that it was going to hurt women's sports, and women have done extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily well in the NIL, NIL market. And they're, mm -hmm. and in fact, women's basketball players are making far more in college than they would make in the WNBA. Right. Uh, and and we've seen players in other sports that have done extraordinarily well. It's not everybody, but you know, you don't hear the same battle cry with regard to playing time. You know, you don't hear people say, "Wait a minute, it is not fair." that Joey Hauser played more minutes than Steven Izzo. That, that's not fair. They both work just as hard. They both spend all that time in practice. It's not fair. And, uh, and everybody should play the same amount of minutes, start the same amount of games, should go to the same amount of press conferences. They, they don't say that because that would be absurd. And it's similarly absurd to suggest that they should all make the same amount of money. The schools can decide what each player is worth 
and and pay them accordingly. And and I don't think the world will spin off its axis and we'll have all these these major problems. And you know, one last thing, you know, when money's involved. Uh, people tend to, to say, especially with college athletes, that it's going to lead to all these negative outcomes. And Tom and I and Greg Campy at Oakland University were at a, uh, uh, an event recently in Detroit, and Blake Corum, the Michigan football player, was there. Mm-hmm. And uh, Corum talked about what he's doing with his NIL money and, and spoke about he's always had a, a strong interest in real estate. He's done a lot of work in that area and he takes his NIL money and he's bought real estate properties with it. And, uh, and, and, you know, part of this is, is, is funny. Like Tom looked at him like he was, he was a God that, you know, most (laughs) athletes, most athletes aren't like you. And that may be true. Most athletes may, may not be like Blake Corum, but more than people are willing to admit are like him. And we're seeing players now in the NIL space becoming financially literate. They're learning to deal with this. They're paying taxes. They're, they're engaged in business activities. They're going to graduate college or leave college uh, way advanced over, over how players left my generation. When I graduated college at 22, uh, I had to learn all that stuff after college. I wasn't taught one thing about that in school. Mm-hmm. And look what these players are doing. And, and, you know, in the doomsday scenario, when when people say they're just going to blow that money, you know, they're going to blow it. If they blow it, they're in the same spot they started with nothing. Lesson. And they've learned something. <laughs> yeah, uh, and right. they're also having to learn to say no. Maybe they're saying no to their families or no to their friends who, who are asking for money or asking them to pick up checks or all that stuff. And I, I, I feel like those are valuable lessons. And, and it's a it's a great educational uh, tool. Uh, in addition to that, I, I, I don't see there's downside in everything, you know, just, and I, I've told this to Tom, uh, and trying to make a, an analogy saying that, you know, a lot of coaches are complaining about this and, and say, you know, if players couldn't drive until now, they weren't allowed to drive while they were co- in college. And, and all of a sudden the NCAA said, all right, you can drive a car. Now you would have some coaches saying what's going to happen now. Like they're going to have to keep their car registered. They're going to have right. to maintain it. Uh, they could get an accident. They could get a DUI. You know, all that stuff's possible. That could, that could happen. But the overwhelming majority of players drive and they do just fine. It's not that big of a deal. Right. We, and we, we also have an example at Michigan State with yeah. Marty Sissoko right. where he's used the entirety of his NIL money, sent it home to his village in Mali to help build a school. We, we had him as a guest earlier in the season, and I believe it was Eric, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when he was growing up, you had to walk, was it 60 minutes or 90 minutes each way? It was an hour, yeah, it was an hour and a half each way to get to 90 school. 90 minutes each way to get to school. Yeah. So he's used his NIL money to begin that program, and I, I don't see how you can look at that as a negative. So lots, exactly. of, lots of positives to this as well. Exactly. What, and, not, and I'll tell you what, not 90 minutes walking to school sounds like he grew up in the Upper Peninsula in Iron Mountain. <laughs> exactly. So coach should be able to, uh, to relate yeah, to snow it. Shoes. Yeah, um, awesome. one, other, one other quick follow-up on this subject, and then I'll turn it back to Eric. Uh, returning to the employment um, structure that, that I also think is inevitable at some point. Do you, force, do you foresee in a, a situation where we are going to have these agreements collectively bargained and we will have some type of union representing the interests of, of student athletes? That's an interesting question. It's a little more problematic, as you know, because uh, uh, different states have different state laws with regard sure. to unionization, uh, and, and it would differ with regard to private schools versus public. So you could certainly have a situation, you may have a trade association rather than a union where the players can bargain collectively, uh, essentially, uh, with, uh, with the NCAA and, and the, the member institutions. I don't think it's necessary. Uh, I, I think it's just, you know, th- there, there aren't like president's unions and coaches unions as a coaches association, but they, they don't collectively bargain for the coaches. Right. I, I, I think it would be simple, just as you offer a player a scholarship now, and you show that player your facilities and all the things that you can do for him or her, you can offer a player a contract. Uh, another school can offer him a contract and, and, and the player can decide. Once they sign on the bottom line, you have a deal. Uh, I, I think it makes it uh, a much easier market to navigate. Uh, and there's some certainty there. 
And just, just as in anything else, you can have provisions in the contract that, that protect the school. And, and the buyout provision or the buyout idea, uh, I think, is a, is a sound one. It doesn't mean every school has to have a buyout. They can let the players walk if they want to. They can negotiate at arm's length however they want. Uh, I, I don't think it's that big of a deal, honestly. I think it would be a much cleaner system. Uh, and, and having the, uh, the recognized market that would be much more transparent. I mean, you know, like just take where I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I work in the legal market there. I'm, I've been a lawyer here for 30 years. When we, when we take uh, lateral moves and, and, uh, and, and hire new associates, we don't, we don't ask the other firms what they're paying, but we know what the range is. Right. And, uh, and it's, it would be similar for players. It, it, would be, it would be pretty clean and easy and certainly much easier than what we have right now, which, and, and you guys know this, we're in, a, we're in a, a period right now where we're just trying to figure it out. And you, you'll probably recall this, you know, people call this the most transformative period in NCAA history. And I, I don't see it that way. I think the most transformative period was in 1984 when I was in college, when the Board of Regents case was decided. As you know, the NCAA used to tell schools how often they could be on television. You know, Michigan State, you can be on once. Notre Dame, you can be on twice on national television. Alabama, twice. Walter Byers was, uh, you know, ran the NCAA single-handedly with an iron fist. And the schools didn't like it. And they sued the NCAA under the same theory that the players sued in the Alston case, which is antitrust. And they won. And in that case, uh, after that case was decided and the schools could sell their own media rights, whether individually or, or collectively as a conference, whatever they wanted, uh, then all of a sudden, you, you know, you had uh, what people called a chaotic situation. They didn't know exactly what to do at the beginning, but they figured it out pretty quick. And all of a sudden, salaries went way up and it became a multi-billion dollar entertainment industry. And it was built intentionally and purposefully, you know, for, for people of a certain age, Ed McMahon didn't knock on the NCAA's door and hand them a publisher's clearinghouse check. <laughs> you know, they did this purpose, purposefully and intentionally. Right. Yeah. And I think it's, it's pretty hard to argue against your position in that because that's what brought us into the current financial landscape and doing the stuff we're talking about with regard to student athletes is just really about divvying that up maybe redistributing it to uh to those who are actually producing some of the value but the value was already created essentially with that move as the kickoff because that's what's led to the modern explosion in in revenue for collegiate athletics there's no doubt about it exactly and and it doesn't mean like if the system opened up and the ncaa said all right no restrictions if you want them to be employ players to be employees go ahead if you don't go ahead do whatever do whatever you want in the marketplace because all these schools are market competitors against one another. And all these conferences are market competitors against one another. They compete for talent. They compete for media rights dollars. They compete for everything. So each individual school can make the decision, you know, we're not comfortable paying our athletes. So we'll give you a scholarship and we'll fly you around private to the games and do all that stuff. But that's it. And, uh, and we're not going to allow NIL money. Uh, and, and they'd have to make that decision to, to see if that would work for them in the marketplace. My sense is they wouldn't get the best players. They would have to settle for lesser players and they'd have to make that decision. Just like the Ivy League, even though it's being challenged right, right now in court, the Ivy League says no merit-based scholarships. Uh, you can have need-based, but no merit-based. They want to do that, fine. Uh, go ahead and see how it works out for you. Uh, it's always been put on the players. You know, the, 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 when I was in school, if I, and I was on an NCAA committee at the time, uh, if I ever stated that, listen, I don't think it's fair that athletes uh, have to remain amateur and that can't receive any compensation at all, they would say, hey, it's your choice. You don't want to play, don't play. You know, if you want to play, you do it our way. But if you don't want to play, if you don't want to do it our way, you don't have to play. Well, then the decision, I think the decision should be on the, sh the schools. You don't want to compete at this level, then don't. Division two and division three are wide open to you. But if we're going to be in this multi-billion dollar entertainment industry, uh, you can't keep shutting out the players and doing and colluding to do it. Yeah. Uh, well, take a quick break just to talk about uh, ways to support the show. Uh, great ways to do that are the three ways. One is you can make sure you like and subscribe on YouTube or on your podcast player. Also, um, you can support our uh 
our show going to the final four is on the schedule.com slash support there. You can give one-time gifts via PayPal or Venmo or a monthly recurring gift. Uh, you also can go to nudge printing. Nudge printing is a great Michigan state uh, alumni run business in Michigan based out in Portland. The shirt I'm wearing right now, you can get there. It is super comfortable. It actually, it's the one I use to win my trip for two to the final four uh, in Houston this year, uh, shooting free throws at Michigan state games. I bet it's super, again, great products. Uh, they do great jobs. They also support the Spartan community. They raise over $155,000 for the, for the Spartan strong effort with the shooting victims on the Michigan state's campus. Uh, Gabe and his team will take good care of you and you get 20% off an order. If you uh, type in final four, uh, when you make your order at nudgeprinting.com, you can also find access to our shirts and hoodies at uh, final force on the schedule slash merchandise. Uh, so I'm the non-attorney here. So I'm going to switch it back a little bit to uh, officiating what you kind of touched on earlier. And one of the interesting things, of course, is as you mentioned, freedom of movement, they keep changing this around. Uh, they've also had a real change here with the blocking and charge calls. Uh, you know, where do you think we are in officiating? Because I think it's always changing. There's and everyone's always complaining. I mean, has it gotten a lot worse. Is it about the same? I mean, Everyone, everyone always complains in every sport about officiating. So you know, is it really that much different in college basketball? Yeah, I mean, you know, generally the officials are great in college basketball. They, they do a great job. They're, they're pros. Now, it doesn't mean every official's great. They, they have, you know, we have 354 Division I institutions. You, you're not oh, yeah. going to have 900 officials that are fantastic all the time. Uh, but the, the, top, the top officials are, are fantastic. I don't believe that the structure that supports them is, is the best it could be. We've got a, an NCAA supervisor of officials uh, and they've been men, but, but his authority extends only to the NCAA tournament. And then there are conference supervisors of, of officials. So I'm not sure that the, the officiating product uh, overall is as consistent as it could be if, if we had a, a better structure but that's not the officials fault. The officials are doing essentially what they're told to do. And, uh, and I think they do a great job. Um, my, my quarrel to the extent I've had one has been with the decisions made by the committees and, uh, and, and the way that the structure works. Um, I do think that years ago when, when, and I was part of it on the competition committee, I'm no longer on that committee and I've been much happier not being on it, frankly, because it's really <laughs> frustrating. But he works but the, good to avoid. <laughs> yeah, the freedom of movement initiative was really successful early on. And somehow part of it might have been pandemic related. But we, I, I believe we kind of let it get away from us a little bit and, and went backward a bit, not back to where we were. The freedom of movement initiative came in when scoring had reached an all time low about mm -hmm. eight, 10 years ago, whatever it is. And, uh, and we were in a crisis, in my view. And we got out of it. Scoring went way up but not free throws and, and the scoring from free throws didn't go way up. And, you know, I feel like college basketball is too physical and, uh, and we need to reduce the physicality. And in fact, if you watch the, uh, the supervisor's weekly whistle, it begins with uh, promoting freedom of movement and reducing physicality. And, and, but if, if, if one complains that we're not where we should be, there's pushback and they say, no, everything's great. And then that, well, then why do we need, to reduce physicality and promote freedom of movement if everything's great. Um, it, 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 it's, we kind of talk out of both sides of our mouth there, but I, I don't care. And, and for some people, this can be a matter of taste. I don't care for the 55, 54 game as much as I care, as much as I enjoy the 85, 84 game or the 95, 94 game. Um, I, I like to see scoring. And, uh, and I, I've had people say in meetings, you have to remember defense is 50% of the game. And I'm like, when is that not true? Somebody's always got the ball and somebody's always on defense. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't make any sense to say that it's a question of emphasis. You know, I, what is the defense allowed to do? And I think it should be difficult for a defense to stop a, a, an offensive player. And, uh, and, you know, to me, you don't do it with, one-on-one -on -one physicality you want to stop you really want to stop somebody bring a double team then they can pass out of it you got to rotate that's basketball if if somebody's allowed to put an arm bar into somebody or or physically uh go after them i i don't think that's basketball that that's my view i don't expect that everyone agrees with that and i know there are a number of smash mouth defensive coaches that say no i want to you know i want to pound people and this and that 
there's a balance there. And I think the NFL, the NBA has reached a really good balance where offense is promoted without, without excluding defense, but it's a question of what, what good defense really is, is good defense, you know, bumping the hell out of somebody, or is it getting a steal or a block or a double team or things like that, or pressing uh, without that, that overtly physical component. So it's difficult. Like I really feel for the supervisors and I really feel for the officials. One thing I do not um, listen to is it's okay for us to have an opinion on a call. Uh, the, the call stands no matter what we say as broadcasters or as fans. We've no broadcaster or fan has ever overturned a single call. The, the officials are the law of the court but we get to have opinions on it. And if the officials are, or, or the supervisors don't like it, um, I, I'm willing to listen to their, their concerns, but I am not willing to listen to people say, you have no right to comment on that uh, because we do. Yeah, well, absolutely. You know, the other sort of controversy, and it seemed like it reared its head near the end of the season, at least we were talking about more in the Big Ten was the was the officials and the amount of games they're doing and sort of the travel that's involved and, you know, doing a game at 10 PM on the Pacific coast. And then you're doing a 2 PM game in, in the East coast. And, you know, I, you know, I'm in medicine and you wouldn't expect physicians to be able to do their job and be cl- crisp and clear, you know, and with that sort of schedule, it's just, because I don't know, unless you're really good at sleeping on planes and not in jet lag doesn't affect you. Do you, I mean, I feel like that's probably gotta be that, that probably affects the game in the way it's called at times. And, and, you know, maybe you have a shorter fuse as an official because you don't have as much sleep. You're dealing with a, a coach. Is that something that you see as a perceived as a problem? And if so, is there, a, is there a solution to that? Is it just hiring the coaches or the, the officials with the, the conferences or what do you think? That, that's a fair point. Uh, and, and this is something I don't blame the officials for this. The officials are independent contractors. Yeah. I think that, I think they need to be hired by the, the, the NCAA and, or the conferences, they need to receive benefits. Uh, they need better training so that we can have younger officials that come up and are, are better trained. Um, because it, it, most of the top officials work so much because that's who the coaches and the conferences want. You know, they want the name brands. The coaches feel more comfortable with them. Uh, there are certain officials, they think, well, I want that guy on the road because he's got the, you know, he, he's got the, the guts to make the call on the road. I mean, for an official, every game's a road game. Every game's a road game for an official. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, they've always got a hostile crowd uh, against them. I, so I'm not a big believer in that, but coaches are, are study that more than, than I do. Um, so I'm not particularly worried about that. Um, I just think it, it, it requires us to uh, protect the officials. Like to me, there are two different things. We can, we can argue over a missed call, like uh, missed calls happen all the time and we have mm-hmm. to expect that that's okay. Uh, and, and, and I'm not condoning it. You know, you want, the officials want to get it right just as much as we want to see them get it right. But w- what I'm more concerned about are recurring calls. How, how are the recurring plays called and are they consistent? And are we consistent in the way that, that we expect them to be called like the charge block? I think the charge block rule is a mess in college and, and we need to move it back. There are too many collisions in college basketball. And when we're so worried about trying to keep players safe, we, we promote and celebrate collisions. And, uh, and I think, it, you know, the, the, the standard for the charge should be taken back to the gather when a player's gathering instead of when the player's foot leaves the floor. Uh, a, a defensive player, a secondary defender can still be moving into a, 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 an offensive player's path until that player leaves the floor. Well, that means if your big toe is still on the floor, that, that defender can still be moving after the offensive player is already committed and a play near the basket. Um, I think the, the charge play that we should value is the primary defender moving his feet to stay in front of a, mm-hmm. a, of a ball handler. A secondary defender coming over from the weak side should have to do something extraordinary to draw that charge. And I, I happen to think a charge block call should be officiated the same way that we look at, at a criminal case. It, it needs to be beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm-hmm. If it is not beyond a reasonable doubt, it is a blo- it's a block, period. Um, but, but people differ with that. You know, but the truth is that the the way the rule is written, the officials get the charge block call right uh, most of the time. 
Um, it, it, they don't get it right as often as they do some other calls. But, you know, I go back to the, I'm not worried about a missed call. It, missed calls happen. I, I'm, I'm more concerned about the recurring calls. And, and, you know, to your original question about do the officials work too much? Maybe, but, but I don't think that's that big of a deal. And if their fuse is a little bit shorter, I think actually uh, officials' fuses need to be really short with coach behavior. Um, the beha generally, I'm not talking about any but one in particular, but generally the way coaches behave in college basketball that is tolerated would be rung up right away in the NBA, right away. The NBA, it, 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 to me, it's kind of sad in a way that NBA coaches behave better than college coaches. Uh, <laughs> the, the officials shouldn't have to listen to these guys screaming at them throughout the game. They shouldn't have to listen to it. And, and the, the, administ the, the administrators at those schools where the coaches do that, don't tell them to stop. And they lay it on the officials to, to do that. They ring them up with a technical. And those guys don't want to do that that often because they're concerned, you know, rightfully so, that some of these coaches are really powerful and all of a sudden that might affect their job assignments. And it's not the right way to go about it. That's another structural problem that, that needs to be fixed because the, the official should not have to listen to this crap. Uh, they should be able to call the game and everybody should just sit down and shut up. You, want, you have a question or concern or a quick reaction after something, fine. But, uh, but they get harangued too much, and it's just not right. So one last question on broader scope issues, and then we'll, we'll get a little more specific to MSU. Uh, there was a lot of talk about this time last year when USC and UCLA were announced to be moving to the Big Ten about the idea that in the near term, sometime within the next decade, the major conferences, whichever one of the five survived, uh, were likely to break away from the NCAA, led by football. Uh, one, do you think, do you sense that that's still, that there's momentum in that direction? And two, if that were to happen, what do you think that does to the basketball postseason? I mean, it would no longer be the NCAA tournament. We'd potentially lose a lot of what I think makes the tournament the event that it is if you're just limiting it to major programs. Um, so what do you think about that issue as a whole? I have heard discussion about breaking off from time to time, but it's not anything that you would think is imminent or in the near future. Uh, so I don't see it as a reasonable possibility in the next decade, uh, but things change with regard to money and we could certainly see it in the future. Uh, the question is, you know, do these revenue, the big revenue producing conferences, do they want to keep sharing all this and, and being told what to do by, uh, by the caboose end of the train right. rather than the engine end? Right. Um, your point about the NCAA tournament is a, is a good one because the NCAA tournament is really the only revenue that the NCAA has. Um, right. yeah. And they, they don't have any revenue with regard to football. Football back in 1984 broke off. And yep. so the NCAA does not control a single dollar from any of these bowl games or, or anything with regard to football. So that's a, that's a lot of revenue that's, that's not flowing through Indianapolis. There is a feeling among administrators that I find palpable that they don't want to, and presidents too, that they don't want to kill the goose that, that laid the golden egg that is the NCAA tournament. But for people as old as I am, they remember back at a time where the NIT was the equal to the NCAA tournament and preferred by some. And, and around about the time, I think it was in the late 70s, there was a rule that came in where the NCAA said, if you get invited to the NCAA tournament, you have to accept the invitation. You can't go to the NIT. The NIT is for people who don't get invited. And, uh, and you know, so that's the structure now. If you get invited, you have to go. You can't play in another tournament. But, you know, the NIT was relegated to second tier status as a result of that rule, primarily. Uh, and, and if the big conferences broke off and started their own thing, um, it would, it, it would immediately supplant the current NCAA tournament. If you took the name brands out of it, if, if they did that, say the power five, power six, whatever we want to call the biggest conferences, if they decided to break away and start their own tournament, there's nothing that would prevent them from inviting uh, non-members of that division to play in a postseason hmm. tournament. So they could invite 
Boise State or I'm pulling names out of out of a hat mm -hmm. or Gonzaga or whomever that might right. not be involved and they could pay them handsomely for competing in that tournament. Uh, so you'd still have the Cinderella aspect to it. Um, but, you know, there, there's still a part of me that thinks that expanding the tournament beyond its current structure would be a mistake. Um, you know, the regular season has to have some value and, it, right. and it's right. know, really exciting and interesting. But the truth is the NCAA tournament has, has the, the regular season is not as watched and consumed as much as I think it should be. And then the NCAA tournament, people go crazy and, and the numbers are, are astronomical. Um, so I don't know the right answer there, but I do know that wherever the most money is, ultimately that's where we will be. Because how many times did we hear over the last 20 years, can't have a playoff in college football, it's impossible. Absolutely, absolutely. And then somebody said, I'll give you a billion dollars for for three games and they said well it's possible now it's possible and now we we're, we got a 12 team playoff coming and that's going to make things in my view even better for for more conferences and more teams now that more teams have a chance yeah there's always that there's always like you said there's a balance of how much you the quality of your postseason tournament and and the value of your regular season right that's why I always been the appeal to baseball that you only have a few teams that make the postseason Versus like the NBA or the NHL where almost every team makes it. But I know there's a lot of money in the postseason, right? That's why all these conferences have their own tournaments, uh, basketball and even and football now, right, too. Um, before we go further, I just want to mention again, if you are in the West Michigan area, you can get a hold of Kurt. And the brothers are just do gutters. If you need gutter work, you need uh, leaf catchers or you need a repair or replacement. But also his partner over in the metro Detroit area. Now you guys can also have access to the brothers just do gutters. They do fantastic work quick, uh, they're efficient and they are fully insured and they do fantastic work. They took care of my house and they, um, you won't regret it. Mention final four, you get 10% off your quote. You can find out ways to contact him on the, the YouTube link here or on your podcast player. Um, so let's move a little bit from global to back to Michigan state, since, you know, this is a Michigan state basketball podcast, Michigan state pretty much returning the team from last season outside of Joey Hauser, uh, you know, Walker returns. Uh, Malik Hall, Jane Aikens, I guess, assuming Aikens and Hogard, who entered the draft sort of, I, whatever the, you know, to get evaluated, but they're, you know, probably most likely going to be coming back. Where do you see Michigan State this next year? And, you know, in, in both in the conference and then from a national standpoint. Similar to what we've seen in the past years, they're going to be ultra competitive. And there, there's, there's not going to be a time in Tom Izzo's tenure where Michigan State isn't legit. It's just not going to happen. There, there are too many players that want to play for them. Uh, and I, I do think when you have players back that have been in the system, you have a chance to be that much better. Uh, but with the, the way they play uh, and, and the way they're, they're developed and coached, uh, I, don't, I certainly don't see Michigan State going anywhere. Um, you know, the, it seems to me, and we don't have enough data to determine it, uh, at least uh, in, a, in a real way, that more players are deciding to come back uh, than in past years because mm -hmm. they can make money in college. I think that's true at Michigan State as well. Um, and I think that's nothing but a positive. And for those of us, and I include the three of us uh, uh, here that believe that education is a good thing, um, how is that not a positive? They're staying to pursue their education and to play. Uh, we fans, broadcasters, you name it, boosters get to, uh, uh, get to see our favorite players play longer and the players are benefiting from, uh, from being at a, a great institution of higher learning. What's the downside? Um, it is changing a little bit, uh, the, the, uh, for high school players that you're not, uh, some of the, the better high school players don't have the same offers that they used to because of the transfer portal. The decision is being made by some coaches that I, if I'm only going to have a player for two years, I'd rather have a junior senior transfer than have a, an inexperienced freshman sophomore. Um, but, the, but we don't see everybody doing that, but, but we'll see a balance uh, come in that in, in, in the future years. I don't think it'll be that difficult to figure out. We've definitely seen with Michigan State, Tom Izzo has been successful in, in keeping his players. Very few have transferred out. I mean, there have been transfers for sure. And a lot of those have been sort of mutual decisions, but, uh, and he's has a big emphasis still on developing players and working with high school recruits. Do you think that's a winning formula or do you think there's going to be a, that, because it seems like if you have a team that is 
all transfers every year or mostly like a Kansas state was successful this year, but we've pointed out there are multitude of, of schools that were unsuccessful in that sort of approach of just sort of like almost a, a rebuild uh, with transfers. How do you think for either Tom Izzo specifically, and then also just in general, do you think the, the transfer sort of high school recruitment balance is going to work for most teams and what's going to be the best, the best formula for success? You know, I, I think a lot of these things that we wind up talking about are, are anecdotal. Like I can point to, mm-hmm. you know, I have this discussion with one of my colleagues, Seth Greenberg, a lot that, that likes to say that you can't win with freshmen. And, mm-hmm. you know, and oftentimes it'll come up when a team like Villanova wins a championship. And first of all, you can win with freshmen because it has been done and it's been done quite a bit, especially by Duke and, and Kentucky. And both of them have won championships with with. Uh, freshmen leading the way so it can be done but but we have a multitude of experienced teams that don't win a multitude of them the the, yeah. the the majority of teams that are older don't win and don't win at that level um so it, it kind of depends it's like back in the day when people say well college coaches can't be successful in the nba well the overwhelming majority of coaches that that are only nba coaches aren't successful either you know, if you use that standard, um, right. it depends on the job you get. So Michigan State's going to be successful no matter what, because Tom Izzo and his staff get the right guys. Uh, they may miss here and there. Everybody misses on a particular player, but y- you don't hear a lot of complaining coming out of East Lansing from players. You may have a player transfer. You know, that happens everywhere, and it's, it's going to continue to happen with, with every program. Not everybody is going to be fulfilled and happy all the time. But generally, uh, Tom Izzo spends as much, if not more time with his players off the floor uh, than any coach I've ever been around. And, and the players trust him. They love him. Uh, maybe not everybody, but, but the overwhelming majority do. And that's not some kind of made up thing that you put in the press guide. That's, that's real. Uh, so as long as he stays in it, I, I mean, the only, the, the thing I feel for most for Tom is I want him to enjoy this as much as he always has. There are times when we talk where he's frustrated and, and I talk to a lot of frustrated coaches and it kind of breaks my heart because they had it a certain way for a long time. And this is changing late in their careers. I think if Tom were 35, he would adjust to this easily, but he's not 35 anymore. And right, right. But his, his complaints not to blow smoke at, at Tom, but his complaints come to the extent he complains come comes from the best possible place. He really is thinking about this isn't the best thing for the players. He's not saying, well, this isn't the best thing for the coaches. This isn't the best thing for, for the, the system or all that. He's saying, I don't think this is the best thing for the players. It's not the way I would raise my kids. It's not what I would choose. And, and I respect that. And uh, he and I don't argue that we agree far more than he thinks we agree. Um, and, and I just, honestly, I don't know a better guy than Tom Izzo anywhere. Well, speaking of that, um, we know that, uh, you mentioned his, you know, he's not 35 anymore. We know that eventually we hope it's still a while down the road, but eventually Michigan state is going to move to a new era and Duke has just gone through that kind of transition, which very few schools do because very few schools have a truly legendary head coach at any time, obviously Duke head coach K and now you've gone through the first year of the transition to, uh, to John Shire as somebody who I would assume is still extremely plugged into that program. uh, How do you think that transition went? And was there anything that surprised about, about that transition? I think the transition from Coach K to John Shire went as well as it could possibly go. Uh, It was unusual, and you don't often see uh, an iconic coach or any coach say, this is going to be my last year, and here's my successor in place. That doesn't happen very often. And that sort of continuity and, and, uh, and succession plan is unusual. Uh, and it's unusual that you would you would have the right person sitting there. Um, you don't necessarily have that everywhere. Uh, but I think it's been extraordinarily successful. And that's in part due to the, the administration decision, Coach K's decision. And then, frankly, just how, 
how great John Shire is. I mean, he, he's he's the near perfect fit for for Duke and for for this job. He, he'd be successful anywhere, but I think he's got a, a an extraordinary uh, career in front of him at Duke for as long as he decides to stay there. So whenever it is, and I hope it's not soon, but whenever it is that Tom decides that it's time to hang it up, um, to me, the, 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 the big question isn't necessarily who, it's how. Uh, is Tom going to just decide to, to, to retire at the end of a season? Uh, or is he going to retire before the start of a season? Is he going to do it kind of like Coach Gay did and say, hey, this is my last year? And and the university has some time to say, well, this is the right person uh, to take over. And he's going to sit next to Izzo the whole year and recruit. And we're going to have that kind of continuity. Um, it, the how is the hard part. And look, we've all seen, we know none of this is going to last forever. We've seen how it's worked well. Um, you know, John Wooden retired at a final four in between the semifinal and the final. Uh, and, and yet he stayed around and went to all the games. He was in his office. You know, some coaches leave and go to a beach house uh, and and walk away. Um, but it's it's hard when these guys stay this long and their, you know, their their DNA is embedded in the program. Um, yeah. it, it's hard for them to leave, and then it's hard for for fan bases to kind of move on. Um, you know, you you heard a lot about hey, when's Coach K going to go to a game? And uh, boy, it seems weird without Coach K there. You know, stuff like that, and it is weird. But but there's a natural progression to it that, uh, uh, you know, we've never seen guys stick around this long. I mean, I never thought we would see coaches in their 70s. Um, right. uh, you know, when I was a kid, when John Wooden retired, I was a kid. I was uh, in fifth grade and he was 65 years old when he quit. And I thought he was the oldest man that had ever walked the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now you've got guys 75 years old that are still going strong. And uh, and that never occurred to me when I was younger. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Izzo is maybe within a couple of years of the age Judd Heathcote was when he retired at Michigan State. And I would say exactly the same thing that you just said about Wooden. It seemed, Judd seemed a lot older to me at that stage than, than Izzo does now. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a curious, it's an interesting observation. It's all the Botox. Go. <laughs> Judd, Judd was, uh, Judd was the funniest dinner speaker I've ever heard. Absolutely. Um, and, Absolutely. And just a joy to be around. Even, even, and, and he was more a joy to be around when he was surly uh, because <laughs> he's even funnier. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a great man. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I guess uh, what about Tom Izzo has made him so successful? I, I guess uh, there have been a lot of successful coaches, obviously. He kind of does his thing. He sort of does things his own way and has always been – everyone talks – describes him as stubborn – Although we've mentioned the show a lot of times that Michigan State, although it has some components that are consistent from year to year, like, you know, toughness and, you know, the things that they value defense, but that they do change. I mean, it's not like the same type, sort of team. They don't play this offense the same way they tend to. But like this last year, we w joked oftentimes that they were Wisconsin. I mean, they, they, they were, uh, you know, shot outside. They were slow pace uh, and, you know, it was just no a very, offensive you know, rebounding, no offensive rebounding. I mean, it was just a very different right. team sort of team. So is that a sign? Is that is Izzo? Is that sort of the success? Is that just a reflection of just people who are successful in their careers? Because obviously the game changes and things like that, or is it, or is it something else? No, I, th I think you're, I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. I think Tom is, I don't see him as being stubborn, except he's stubborn in his values and principles. And, and, and I don't see that as stubborn. I, I see that as, you know, he, he's got, he's got, principles that he's going to stick to now, but he adapts in every other way. You know, he'll adapt the way his team plays. Like he could sit and say, we're going to, we're going to be a fast break team. Like we had in, in the early two thousands with Charlie Bell and Mateen Cleaves and, and all those guys, Mo Pete. Um, but he didn't have the personnel to do that this year. They, they, they didn't have the same kind of big guys that they've had in the past, but he adapts. He's an offensive genius. Um, he can get his team a shot in so many different ways. And uh, after timeouts, you know, he's, he's a brilliant basketball coach. Uh, but he's also, uh, he's also got an amazing heart as a coach that he really does love his guys. He loves them enough that he's going he's gonna to be hard on them when it's time. 
but but he keeps them confident. He wants them to go for it. Um, he's un he's unafraid to lose, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. he's willing to lay oh, it on absolutely. the line anywhere, anytime, unafraid. And uh, and that's not true of everybody. Uh, certainly, everybody, all, all the coaches I know. Um, he is, and I've said this in the past, um, and it, it remains true. You know, Tom Izzo is one of the greatest coaches in the history of American sport. If he coached football, he'd be the same type of coach with the same success rate. Uh, he could coach lacrosse or swimming or whatever, and he'd have the same success rate. Uh, he's, he, he claims to love football more than basketball, but, but he's an extraordinary basketball coach. And, uh, and, and an extraordinary person. But I think the person part of it is the separating factor that, that you know, there are other coaches that I, I believe could X and O in Tom's league. There aren't that many of them. He's a, among the elite uh, in that regard, but he's not the only one. Uh, but the fact that, that he has so much heart on and off the floor and he's so relatable to his players, you know, there's never a time when, when you don't know where you stand with Tom. And there's never a time. And that's a good thing. And as much as he may correct players and be critical uh, of, of the way they're doing things in order to improve, he catches them doing something right, too. Like he keeps them confident. He wants them to do well. Um, and that's one of the reasons I would have loved playing for him. Um, but 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 he I'm telling you, he would have hated me. He would he, he would not have wanted me on his team. <laughs> Why, why, is, why is that specifically? Oh, he would have called me a pretty boy from California. <laughs> stick your nose in there and knock somebody on their ass. And you're not tough enough. And but but I, 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 I can't remember that I, I gave him a hard time over this or Greg Campy or, or some. I when when I was uh, in in Detroit a few weeks ago for that that uh, Greg Campy event. And Tom was kind enough to come in from East Lansing and, and be with me and, and Blake Corum and Greg for that event. And he certainly didn't have to do that. Uh, I played golf with Greg Campy at Oakland Hills, his country club. Uh, and we teed off at nine in the morning. And when we teed off, it was 38 degrees. And we were the only ones playing. You know, it was a clear, crisp day. And it really was incredibly pleasant. It was, I didn't think it was that cold relative to what I expected when I woke up and saw the 38 degrees thing. <laughs> But I was sitting there telling Greg, like, where are all these tough Michiganders that talk about, <laughs> you know, how they they truck through the snow and, you know, nothing bothers them and oh, a little bit of a little bit of chilly weather. Who cares? None of them showed up till afternoon. We'd already played. and We're having a burger after the round. And then they all showed up when it got up to like 50 degrees. And I'm like, you know, it, it, like, I can't wait to see Izzo when, when he talked about how tough, how tough, like they would have been playing in the UP if it was snowing, you know, when they had a tea time, right? Uh, none of them showed up. It was the, it was the wimpy California pretty boy that went out and played in the cold, not any of the Michiganders. We just tell that to people who aren't from the state. That's our, that's our secret, right? Do you, do you think right. we're out there suffering? Uh, la last question. And, and again, we want to thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, it's never a question, never a debate who the greatest player in Michigan State basketball history is. We all know the answer to that one. Matt but, Stagenga? Right, <laughs> close. <laughs> but, but the debate over who's number two is, a ver is very much a live one. Um, you know, you could talk about Scott Skiles, Mateen Cleaves, Greg Kelser, perhaps. Uh, I think Cassius Winston belongs in that discussion um maybe steve smith based on just their msu careers who would be your choice wow that's really difficult um, yeah i i agree <laughs> i would probably put steve smith up there first um mm -hmm. but but that that's difficult i mean you know mateen cleaves and and that whole crew charlie bell and 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 morris peterson and the like they really uh, that 99 through 2001 group really started the, the, the Izzo dynasty. And right. I'll tell you this, that when, you know, I was kind of really getting going and broadcasting about that time. And, uh, and I, I had a lot of friends in the big 10 that were assistant coaches and I would always call and say, Hey, you know, what's going on in the league? Tell me what you're seeing, things like that. And, and, I had so many people around 1997, probably 97, 98, say, hey, man, Michigan State's coming. And uh, not to curse on here, but but they would go, 
Michigan State's a bitch, man. <laughs> and I started watching a lot more film of Michigan State and their break. And, and Michigan State would grab a rebound. And then you would see the opposing bench, all the coaches jump up and they're going, get back, get back every play. And yeah. people were afraid. Coaches were afraid of their break and the way they rebounded. Like I did, you know, I go to their practices and I would go, I've never seen anything like this. Um, it was like a fist fight for rebounding. Um, and, you know, Tom would say, well, we couldn't make a shot back then. So we had to, you know, we had to rebound in order to right. get the score. Yeah but it's part of their DNA. And that always fascinated me because I never thought uh, our Duke teams when I played were, were proficient rebounding teams. We were good, but we weren't great. And Michigan State was great. And they, they've continued to be uh, throughout the years. It's a staple of their program. But yeah, I, you know, probably Steve Smith, Mateen Cleaves. Um, but I, I tend, when I think about Michigan State, I tend to think about groups of guys. Mm. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm looking at it the wrong way, but you know, I, I don't often go into to the President Center and look up at the the individual players. You know, you see the Magic Johnson statue, and then you see the uh, the, the 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 when you walk into the building, you see that that uh, likeness of Izzo. That it's almost like right. a wax museum thing. <laughs> Absolutely, me, it's creepy. Yeah, right. to me, he looks like Jamie Dixon. <laughs> yeah he does like, he looks yeah. exactly like what is jamie dixon statue doing in in uh, uh you know <laughs> madame tussauds wax museum of jamie dixon doing in there in izzo's house but well, i tend you know, to think you know of the of, teams they've you, had you know a lot of people compare the magic johnson statue to bill russell yeah so there's a there's a little bit of that going around <laughs> yeah but but it, it is a great question and and i think it speaks well of the program that maybe maybe i'm i'm an outlier in this but that I, that i tend to think about their teams and their collection of players and groups of players rather than you know like going back to antonio smith and that whole crew um than i do thinking about you know this litany of individuals they've had and maybe i'm looking at it the wrong way but but that's the that's the feeling i've always had and you know, I like I, I uh, I've done this with a few programs, but like I, I buy gear wherever I go. I don't know why I do it, but I don't, I always buy a T-shirt from where I am and and uh, like a pair of workout shorts or something. And back, I don't work out. I, I'm sure you can tell I don't work out as much as I used to. But whenever I wore Michigan, I would never wear it when I was going to mail in a workout. I only wore the Michigan State <laughs> stuff when I was going to go after it because uh, that is like it was like there was Izzo in my ear saying, if you're going to wear that stuff, man, you better bring it. And uh, so I, I never wore it unless I was really going to have a, a strong workout that day. Oh, Jay Billis, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter at Jay Billis. Uh, I, I don't know. Is there any other place people follow you besides watching you on TV and ESPN, right? Nobody follows me. Occasionally a cop, but <laughs> but nobody follows me. All right. Well, uh, thanks for so much for being on the show. Again, reminder, you can check out our uh, support the show at the final fours on the schedule.com slash support. Uh, you can find ways to support us through nudge printing or the brothers at just two gutters. Uh, also, uh, you can check out uh, ways of doing uh, one-time donations or monthly support, but until next time, the final fours on the schedule go green. And next time, Hey, if anybody in Michigan wants a December tea time, call me. You wimps won't show up, but I'll I'll be there. I'll be there playing the cold, and Izzo my, will be in front of the fire with hot chocolate. My son plays <laughs> high school golf. Let me tell you, they don't ever have nice weather. He's always playing in the snow. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jay. Thank you. <laughs>